have work to do, not so much in learning the facts, although I will claim we need a lot more facts to be, to be learned, but in how to have the conversation how to think about what it means to have a conversation that is difficult, that's painful, that deals with inequality, that makes people feel bad and yucky and anxious or angry and frustrated, and that how we talk about those issues is almost as important, maybe in some cases more important, than what we talk about in those moments. So rather than sit here and give you a history of African-American wah, 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 you can come to my classes for that, they're open all the time, Sometimes they sell out, but you know how it is. But, you know, you can come and I can tell you all about various modes of structural inequality, and I'm, I can wax eloquently for hours. But what I want to talk about now in this itty-bitty amount of time is about how I figured out a few strategies for responding to those circumstances I just described. What kind of conversation should we have? What are the keys to figuring that out? So there are three central ones. There are others, but for our time purposes, I have three. And the first one is, as we're thinking about how to have these very difficult discussions, we all have to remember one thing, that we are both individuals and members of groups. This seems enormously basic, kind of like maybe even third grade, but it's actually very complicated to keep in your mind. Why? Because first of all, in the United States, we're incredibly focused on individuality. We think and swear that we are the most interesting individual, total broke the mold human being on earth. And that nobody could possibly be just like me. I mean, I've you know, fallen prey to that. Well, there's just this very special, unusual thing about I just don't know anyone who you know, feels that way. You know, this, these things happen. And then you find three people who are just like, dang, you do that too? What's left? So there's, you know, there's a lot of drive that our specialness is all about us being individuals. But we're all members of groups. None of us sprung freely from some imaginary place in our minds, Harry Potter notwithstanding, to land on Earth and populate the world as if we have no foremothers, forefathers, family members, communities, etc. So we're members of groups. And every one of the groups in which we have membership have social histories and relationships. And those social histories and relationships connect to other people, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. If we don't look at individuals as members of groups and as unique individuals, I know we gotta keep reminding ourselves about that. If we don't remember the groups to which we belong and to which other people we talk to belong, then we're not able to necessarily fully grasp what it means for them to be in the world in ways that is very different than us. So without that attention to that group history doesn't mean that people have the exact relationship to that group history. But it does mean that they might share experiences based on that identity, whatever it be, whether it's class, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, etc. That's just to name a few of the big ones. Now, um, as we think about this group identity, we have to be informed historically. So a little asterisk here and a little plug for education, not necessarily in the classroom. In fact, much of it has to happen elsewhere. But we have to know about these groups of people. We can't just think we know based on, you know, I don't know what we saw on TV or what we saw on The Wire. Say, for example, you know, I get a lot of that. Isn't The Wire like, you know, like, no, it's, been that. it's not really. <laughs> I'm like, no, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really sure. <laughs> you know? Positive, great story, story. Okay, so you know, we have to have a broader range of real serious knowledge and investment. The second thing we have to be careful to do as we have these conversations that are, I'm hoping, are going to enable new and creative ideas for really ending systemic inequality. There'll always be some, but systemic reinforced inequality. We can fix that. Second one is to have an honest conversation, even about the most painful, difficult elements. This is very tough to do because we're trained to speak about these things in euphemisms, especially in this historical moment, where saying certain things is almost as if you're acting it. If you say race, you're a racist. Or if you mention there's gender oppression, you're somehow, you know, some radical psychotic feminist who just wants to kill all men on earth or something. It just gets rather insane really quickly. And, and I want to say, look, the best thing we can do is call it what it is in the interest of creating as much community as we can because if we're not honest about whatever's happened or what people are feeling or what is taking place, we don't stand a chance of getting to the other side. It, because we're, we're so busy evading it, sometimes out of guilt and anxiety and hopefully avoiding hurting people, but we're so busy avoiding it that we actually do injury in the present. 
So if we're not able to talk about human suffering honestly and openly, it's going to be very, very difficult not to have a person in the room who's saying, well, wait a minute, is no one going to pay attention to what I've experienced or what I think I've experienced? Is, can, I, can I not put this on the table? And, and it creates a condition of present day suffering. So we have to be honest. Now, of course, it also helps to be thoughtful, not just honest in a you know, sort of irresponsible way. That means you have to do your homework. So we're back to point one. I think every point will lead to read and do homework. I'm sorry about that, but I just am I'm programmed. Um, but, but it is important to really have a sense of, of how to be honest, to model the complexity of that. We're always going to be on one short end or another. None of us are, are perfectly situated to never be on the anxious, guilty side of the conversation. We're always going to be there at one point or another if we're listening and thinking. The third thing that I think is extremely important, and I learned this again as you know, years of teaching uh, fell under the bridge. No one got hurt, though, during that. Um, um, after years of teaching, I began to realize that the ideas that I was hoping to impart included data and information that caused a lot of anxiety, caused a lot of fear, caused a lot of guilt, caused a lot of you know, denial and you know, frustration and all kinds of feelings. And you know, for a while, you know, when I first got out of graduate school, my business was just to impart data and keep moving. You know, so I, had, I wasn't really paying attention. I guess I was so overwhelmed with making sure I had a decent lecture that it followed and was coherent and that I wouldn't just get fired on the spot that, that I didn't pay attention to the fact that you know, students were like tuning forks. You know, they're like, wah, 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 wah. You know, like then occasionally some would come to my office hysterical and be like, what are you tripping? Were you tripping? Why are you tripping? You know? <laughs> What's the problem, you know? And then it began to occur to me, you know, it didn't take that long, I'm kind of sharp, but um, it began to occur to me that this was an emotional project a a on a human level, along with an intellectual, theoretical, conceptual project, and that you can't talk about systemic structural inequality, particularly when you're talking about it in the same spaces where it's taking place. And that's very different. If I want to talk about you know, gender oppression in Nairobi, people are fascinated by that. It's terrible and troubling, but they don't turn usually to a person from Nairobi and say, so how's that going? <laughs> right? They've got a big gap, right, in experience. They don't have to live around it and deal with it. But when you work on the United States and you teach in the United States and you teach people who happen to be living in the United States, the level of anxiety raises. So the third thing is in this trinity of figuring out how to have the right kind of conversation is um, handling that emotional space one way or another, being honest about it and, and recognizing that it's going to happen. Now, 